Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us on this lovely Monday morning. Hazak Baruch, as well to our anonymous sponsor. Uh, these, uh, today's class should be L'Fu'ash Lema Ol Ram Yisrael. Thank you so, so much. Um, we are studying together, Rabotai, Inu Perasha, Perashat Bo. So let us open up our Humashim. And our Perasha deals with uh, Perashat Bo. Well, for starters, we have to finish the 10 plagues. We didn't finish them. Last week, we only read about seven. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes? Okay, great. So last week we only read seven plagues. This week we have the final three. Okay? And the final three, Arbe, Locusts, Hoshech, Darkness, and Makat, Bechorot. Lots to speak about just in those three plagues. Uh, but let's just give a quick, uh, again, a quick summary of the Perashah. So here are those three plagues. By the way, I always... Um, just, it's good to repeat this. Perashat bo, bet aleph is a numerical value of, anyone know? Bet is two, aleph is one, that's three. So that's a nice hint of the three makot that are in this perashah. The name of the perashah has a numerical value of three. Bet and aleph, two and one. The perashah continues after the ten plagues um, are over. After makat bechorot, and Hashem goes on and He actually, He actually, um, Gives Moshe and Aaron a mitzvah. This is the first um, national mitzvah that we're given. As a nation, it's the mitzvah of uh, Kiddush HaChodesh, of sanctifying the month, which is something that we used to do when we had a Beitin. Today we don't do it. Uh, maybe we'll give a class on exactly how we don't do how we do it today, why we don't do it. But basically, today the the new month is uh, based on you know in English. January 1st this is just January 1st. Back then, it was based on the moon, the new moon, and when we would have two witnesses coming into Beit Din and telling us that they saw that new moon. And it's only when the Beit Din gets together, when the rabbis say, Mekudash, that the month is sanctified. And from the new month, we know when all the holidays are. Okay? Um, so, again, we don't go with the sun, we go with the moon, which is either 29 days long or 30 day long month. Hashem as well commands us on the Pesach offering, which we'll come back to today, Billy Neded, the Pesach offering, okay? That is the Korban Pesach, that's the name of the holiday, by the way, holiday of Pesach, the Korban that we would have to eat in the times of the Beit HaMikdash today, unfortunately. We don't have that Korban. Anyone that's learning the Daf is learning about all, of, all about Korban Pesach. We are doing now Masechet Pesachim right in the middle. The Perasha continues with the plague of the firstborn and the death of all the firstborns. Paro surrenders and the exodus. We finally leave Mazal Tov, Hazak U Baruch. Okay? We leave Egypt and Hashem wants us to remember the firstborns because I saved the Jewish firstborns. And that's why we have a Pidyon Habin for the Jewish firstborn males. Again, not such a simple topic. We have to understand it. Why only male? Why about what about firstborn from the dad? Why not them? Etc. These are a lot of questions that we have to get to this week, God willing, in our Perasha class. I would like today to study about a little bit the Korban Pesach. So if we could open up together to Two. Let's open up chapter 12. Okay, everybody have a chumash? Let's open up to chapter 12, please. And um, there is a very interesting pasuk. Okay, and again, uh, a lot of what we're saying today is from Mariah Bernstein. Um, just amazing chidushim. So here we are, Perek Yudbet, pasuk Chaf Aleph. Okay? Vayikra Moshe lechol ziknei Yisrael. Everybody ready? Okay, here we go. Moshe Rabbeinu calls to the elders of Israel. Vayomer he says to them. This is again, just to put it in context. Um, a lot of times we forget uh, what's going on. So right now the Jewish people are in Egypt. We're technically still slaves. We didn't leave yet. It's in the middle of all of the plagues. This is happening right between the ninth plague of darkness and the tenth plague of Makat Bechorot the death of the firstborns 
in between those two makot, and there was a few weeks in between, in between every makah there were a few weeks, Moshe calls the Jewish people, Mishechu ukhu lachem tzon, draw forth and buy for yourselves a sheep for, your, for yourselves, one of the flock for your families, veshahatu ha-pasach, and slaughter the Pesach offering. So Moshe Rabbeinu is gathering all of the elders of the heads so that they could tell their people, because again, there's, uh, there's three million Jews. Moshe is not going to be able to speak to all three million. So he tells the word to each make-believe. The president gives the message to the governor, and the governor gives the message to his own people, to each state. The Zomoshe Rabbeinu calls the Zekenim, he tells them about the Korban Pesach. This is a Korban that's brought once a year. We did it when we had a Beit HaMikdash. If we had a Beit HaMikdash, every one of us today would have to partake in a Korban Pesach. Okay, It was basically a sheep or a lamb that was roasted, and um, Moshe tells them, Ulkahtem, and then, Take a bundle of Ezov. You know what Ezov is? Ezov is like in English. Hisap. Ezov, Hisap, Ezov. It's the same word. Okay? Hisap, Ezov. Take a bundle of Hisap. Utvaltem badam. And dip it in a basin of blood. Touch the lintel and the two doorposts. So dip it in blood and put it around your doorposts. We know this, right? Why? Why, why are they putting a doorpost? So that the angel of death doesn't come into their home, right? Right? Now, by the way, side question that I love asking. I thought Hashem was the one that did Makab Echoro. So if God's the one doing it, what do you need the blood for? Okay, great question. Lots of questions. Lots of questions. And God says, please do not leave your house till morning. And Hashem will pass over. He will see the blood and He will jump over your homes and He will not allow He will not permit the destroyer to come into your homes. Again, destroyer? I thought God was the one doing it. Okay. And keep this mitzvah of Pesach forever. Now, ah, okay, very nice TEA, very nice answer. Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, now, the truth is, this, this paragraph, Moshe calls the elders, and it begins with a very interesting word. That word was, mi she hu. Mi she, mi she, mi, no, no, I'm kidding, it's not, it's not the same mi she. Okay, mi she hu means, draw forth. What does that mean? Mishhu, draw forth. Ukhulachem, and buy for yourselves. Which one is it? Should I draw? What's the difference between drawing forth and buying a sheep? What's the difference? Rashi, right away, off the bat, Rashi, open up Rashi, he tells us, Misha yesh lotzon, whoever has a sheep in his backyard, Mishhu, should draw it in from the backyard. He should pull in the sheep and use that sheep for the Korban Pesach. Which, by the way, again, just to clarify, the sheep was tied on their bedposts from the 10th for four nights until the 15th uh, night or the 14th afternoon. They would slaughter it and they would eat it at night. Leil Pesach, the 15th night of Pesach, when we get together and we eat matzah and the whole seder, they ate this korban with matzah as well. And Rashi, again, Rashi tells us, if you have a sheep, go and get one from there. And that's the word mishchu. And if you don't have a sheep, yikach min hashuk. Go and buy from the marketplace. And that's why there are two verbs for take a sheep. Mishchu, ukhu. Take one if you have one. Buy one if you don't have one. Okay, this is simple. This is simple. This is very simple. Now, of course, nothing simple. Comes along Rabbeinu Bahyeh, and he has a beautiful chidush. Says Rabbeinu Bahyeh, and he writes something that's very fascinating, explaining again um, this pasuk mishchu. Says Rabbeinu Bahyeh, who was a commentary from seven, eight hundred years ago, and he writes something that's a little bit 
hard to understand, but he says you have to go back to understand to Bereshit 37, 28. Okay, well, we listen. We go back to Bereshit, chapter 37, Pasuk 28. Lamed Zayin, Pasuk Chachet. Says the Pasuk, oh, we're in the middle of the brothers and Yosef. Yosef comes to check up on his brothers. They throw him in a pit. Says Pasuk 28, Midianite men, traitors, passed by. And they drew forth Yosef from the pit. And they sold Joseph, says Rabbeinu Bachye. You want to understand the Mishchu of Korban Pesach? Since our father's initial descent to Egypt <coughs> was through a Meshicha, a drawing forth, drawing forth not of a sheep, drawing forth of a brother of Yosef, like it says, Vayim Shechu Vayalu et Yosef Min Habor. They drew Joseph from the boar, and therefore we have to draw a sheep. And what Rabbi Bachya here is telling us is very clear. And that is, he is maybe if not implying, he is saying very explicitly that the reason the Jewish people ended up being slaves in Egypt for all of those 210 years was because of Mechirat Yosef. Because of the sale of Yosef, that's how we have to fix, that's the tikkun that's needed. They sold Yosef, and therefore to get out of Egypt, which was a result of that sale, we as well need to make sure we do another type of meshicha, not a meshicha for the bad like they did, we have to do a meshicha, a drawing forth for the good. So in other words, what we are being informed of here by Rabbi Nubahye, is that the relationship between the sale of Yosef and the Egyptian exile was not merely sequential, but it was also causational. It was not just a, you know, something that happened and then something else happened. It wasn't just a sale and then afterwards, in sequence, we were in Egypt slaves. It was actually a cause and effect. We were slaves because of the sale of Yosef. This is a very profound statement of Rabbeinu Bachye, but of course, it, the first place is not over here in Rabbeinu Bachye. This actually appears in our sages. This appears in the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat. So let us quickly open up Masechet Shabbat, page um, Yud, Amud Bet. Quickly open it up. Give me one, uh, one second. Masechet Shabbat, page And the author of the statement is Rava Bar Where is it? Amar Le Here it is Rava Bar Mahseya Okay, so anyone who wants to open up um, page Yud Amud Bet of Masechet Shabbat. Amar Rav Bar Mahsiya, Amar Rav Hama Bar Guria. Amar Rav, okay. So he said the name of him and the name of him. Fine. Bottom line. Le'olam, here is the statement. Forever, be very careful. Al Yeshane Adam Beno Ben Habanim. A person must be very careful not to favor a child over other children. Shebishvil Mishkal Shnei Salaim Melat. Because... Of a robe that was merely two slaim, two coins worth. Shenatani Yaakov la Yosef that Yaakov gave his son Yosef yoter mishar banav more than he gave his other kids. One extra robe that he gave him. Nit kan uboy have the brothers got jealous. Venit galgel hadavar and the matter resulted yardu avotenu lemitzrayim that eventually we went down to Egypt. And so this is a Gemara, it's very clear. The Gemara here seems to be clearly uh, implicating that the tension between Yosef and the brothers resulting in the sale is what caused our eventual descent there and the avdut, the slavery that we had to endure in Egypt. 
As well, there is a midrash to Yilim that Rabbi Bernstein brings down, and that is that Hashem said, Amara Kadosh Baruch Hu, you sold your brother as a slave. I promise every year you will have to say, Avadim Hayinu, we were slaves. And so this midrash, again, he seems to be uh, implying um, uh, the same idea that the two are a cause and effect. They are res result from one the other. And this is something that's repeated many times in later commentaries. But again, in the early source, excuse me, sources, it is found here right away in Rabbi Nubachye, in the Gemara. It's found in the Midrash Tehillim. The question that we have to ask ourselves is a very simple question. If we turn back to the famous Brit Ben Abetarim, the start of it all, the first hint that we were going to once upon a time going to be slaves. Remember where it was first pro, uh, predicted? It was told by God to Abraham. It's not a prediction. <laughs> it was a guarantee by God. Breed ben Abetarim. So let's go back to Bereshit, chapter 15. God says to Abraham Avinu, to Abraham Avinu, Yadoa teda, you shall surely know. Ki ger, God says to Abraham, chapter 15, Pasuk 13, Your children will be slaves in a foreign land. This was a punishment to Abraham. Remember last week, uh, I believe this question was asked. What did Abraham do wrong? There were a few things that he did wrong. Either he doubted God, he asked for a guarantee. Um, whatever the sin of Abraham was, God already punished Abraham Avinu, telling him that we're going to be slaves. For 400 years, we're going to need to be slaves in a foreign land. And so it was already told to Abraham Avinu. And so the question that bothers us is, if Abraham already was told that we're going to be slaves, then what's it got to do with Yosef's sale? Yosef's sale has nothing to do with it, whether he was sold or not. We would be slaves. We would be slaves because God told Abraham you're going to be slaves. What does Yosef and the sale of Yosef have to do with it? Take it a couple of seconds if anyone wants to try to take a guess. Ah, beautiful. Baruch atah Adonai Elohim Melech HaLam Shehakol Ni'elam. The answer, says Jennifer beautifully, is that. And the answer is given by Tosfot. Tosfot, this is um, this is question is raised by Tosfot on the above Gemara, and it is answered by Tosfot. And the answer that he gives is that yes, it was decreed that we will need to be foreigners in a land, but it was never decreed that we would have to endure persecution. It was never decreed that we would have to be in Egypt. The level of difficulty was never decreed. Meaning, meaning, you know, it says God says to Abraham. Va'avadum, ve'inu otam, which is vav. Now, what does vav mean in Hebrew? Vav. Vav usually we translate as end. However, it's not always true. Vav could also mean or. Okay, and there are many proofs of this of this throughout the um, the, the chumash that sometimes the word vav is used, but it can mean or. Okay, and therefore, what God is saying to Abraham Avinu is, if you want, geri yezaracha, or va'avadum, or inu otam, they will enslave them, or they can torture them. Not all have to be true; it can be one or the other. And the biggest proof of this: how many years were we supposed to be in Egypt? Who remembers the, the pasuk we just we just read it? Arba meot shana. How many years is that? 400 years. So we are supposed to be slaves for 400 years. But one second, we know that we were in 400. It was only 210. Where's the other 190? Well, you're going to answer me. Well, the 400, the clock already started from Yitzchak's birth. Now I want to ask you all a question. When Yitzchak was born, were we slaves yet? We weren't slaves. For 190 years, we weren't slaves. So you see that the clock already started once we were strangers in a land that we didn't feel like we were uh, the owners of, which was already from the birth of Yitzchak. And it could have stayed like that. The level of 
uh, in the, the intensity of persecution did not have to be as it was in Egypt. It could have remained a very light uh, penalty, a very light sentence. We would be foreigners. For example, right now we're foreigners in America. And this is maybe, let's make believe, part of our exile. It doesn't have to be as intense as it was in other times in history. The reason it ended up being in Egypt and it ended up being so intense and slaves and, and killing babies, that's because the sale of Yosef. So we see over here a beautiful Hidush that comes out that um, um, there were two causes for why we ended up being in Egypt. Number one was Breed Ben Abetarim. That was the promise that God told Abraham Avinu. They will be foreigners, strangers. But who decided that it's going to be in Egypt, that it's going to be so intense? That was because of the sale of Yosef. And if that's the case, and if that's the case, we have to now proceed and ask, how was the exile to Egypt a fitting consequence of that act of selling Yosef? Meaning, meaning, we made a sin, the sin of selling of Yosef. And if Egypt's the answer... Or if Egypt is the result, that means that Egypt somehow is a tikkun for the sale of Yosef. It was a fix. That was how we fixed the slavery that we had to, uh, the, of Yosef, that we should be slaves. How does one fix the other? That is, that is the question. And the answer is that the sale of Yosef was maybe what we did wrong, but that's just a symptom. The sale is a symptom and that represents something much deeper. It represents the fragmentation that had developed between the brothers. That the brothers were no longer united. That the brothers were divided amongst themselves. The sale was just a result. But the, the root of the problem was much deeper. And it was that there was no longer a unity uh, amongst the brothers. And that, uh, that divisiveness... Um, is what we had to fix. Okay, you know the... Um, one second. Yes, that is a very interesting point. We'll get back to that, correct. Okay. And so, what happens? What happens? The Jew The Jewish people have... They, they're split, right? They're no longer connected. There's hatred, there's fighting, the brothers, there's mahaloket. And so God says, I have to put that back. And unfortunately, and as we have experienced many times in history as Jews, that when they're, um, the, you know, we, we get along much better when we're subjugated, unfortunately. When there's persecution, Right? When there's an external oppressor, when there's somebody from the outside that's coming in and that's persecuting us, we are able to remove and forget about the differences. You know, like the, like this, you know, the story of the Jew in the cab that we said so many times. He gets into a cab and, um, and he says to the driver, Shalom, Achi, hello, my brother. And the cab driver is a chiloni. The cab driver is a secular man. And this Jew in the, in the back seat is, you know, black hat and everything. So the cab driver, very offended, how dare you call me your brother? He turns and he says, We are not brothers. And the Jew smiles and he says, No, 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 we are brothers. And the, the cab driver again, disgusted, says, We're not brothers, stop saying that. And he says, No, we are brothers. You know who told me we're brothers? Hitler told me that we're brothers. Because Hitler didn't care if you're black hat or white hat, or no hat, or religious, or not religious to him, you were a Jew, you're all the same. Hitler reminded us that we were brothers. And it was that uh, the slavery, the experience that we uh, endured of being persecuted as a people in Egypt, which was able to remove the differences that we had amongst us, and it was able to foster a sense of unity amongst Am Israel and to bring us closer. And in this regard, the... The smelting furnace that our rabbis speak of, that Egypt, that going down to Mitzrayim was to serve as a, a furnace to, to do what? Usually we view it as a furnace to refine us, right? You take silver, you take gold, you put it in a furnace, it purifies it, it removes all of the dirt within the silver, within the gold. 
But on a deeper level, the smelting furnace was not only to refine us as a people, but it was also, says Rav Bernstein, to combine us as a people. It was to unify Klal Yisrael. So again, one more time. We went down to Egypt because of the sale of Yosef. But again, the sale is only indicating a much deeper problem that there is, uh, that there is machloket, that there is fighting amongst Am Yisrael, amongst the people, amongst the brothers. And so God had to bring us closer. And the way he brought us closer was in this furnace of Mitzrayim. And that achdut was achieved. The breach in unity had to be repaired. And the experience of exile was the best way to repair it on a... Um, on a fundamental level at least. So with this in mind, by the way, we, we now answer another question. We, we wonder, wait, so if we're supposed to fix the sale of Yosef, Yosef wasn't guilty for the sale of Yosef. Binyamin wasn't guilty for the sale of Yosef. So why did Binyamin and Yosef had to endure slavery in Egypt? That's a very powerful question. They didn't do anything wrong. They didn't make the sale. You know, he's, Yosef's the victim. Binyamin wasn't involved. But now we understand. Because the point is not that... The, uh, we're not trying to fix the sale per se. But we're trying to fix the, the lack of un, unity that was amongst the brothers. And that was true with Binyamin. That was true with Yosef. For sure, we, we see it with Yosef. Because he is the one that provokes the brothers a little bit to uh, sell him with his slander against them. He would tell on his brothers. And so, all of the Shivatim had to be in Egypt. With this, we come back to the Korban Pesach. We come back to this uh, offering of Pesach. And we will see, um, as many, many commentaries point out, that the, the exact Korban that we had to bring had many features and characteristics that served to uh, symbolize and identify this idea of unity. And so we're going to see now some details of the Korban Pesach. So let us go back to our Perashat, Perashat Bo. Number one, look at the, we're going to just point out a couple of unique laws in the Korban Pesach. First of all, like we read, the Pasuk says, Perek Yud Bet, Pasuk Chaf Bet, 12, 22. The Pasuk says, Take an agudat ezov. And this is something that the Ben Ishchai says. Take a bundle of hyssop and dip it in blood. What does that remind us of? What else was dipped in blood? The robe of Yosef. The reason we went down into Galut to begin with. Started with dipping in blood. God says, you got in here because of dipping in blood? You're going to get out of here by dipping in blood. But two very different dippings. The first dipping was again a, divisi, uh, a dipping of, of separation. A dipping of mahloket. A dipping of hatred of a brother. Now you're going to dip. It's going to be a dipping of agudat ezov. Take a bundle. Not one hisab. Take a bundle of ezov. Now we have to be together to see if we truly learned our lesson. Another uh, example. The Pasuk says, Mishechu ukhu lachem tzon lemishpot, For your families. A very important component in the Korban Pesach was the idea of family. Which is again something that unfortunately in today's day and age is something that's not respected so much. The sense of family, the idea of family, the idea of getting together in the world that we live in. People get together maybe once a year for dinner. You know, you know when they hear that we have Shabbat every Friday night with people getting together and we have such a large meal. You know, they have this once a year on a Thursday night. But as a Jewish people, we have this every single week. We have many holidays, the idea of a mishpacha and preserving the family unit, strengthening the family unit. That was again a much, uh, a much important component of the Korban Pesach. But it's not only the family, it's eating together as a family. Again, if we go back real quick to Bereshit, right after the brothers throw Yosef in a pit, chapter 37, Perek Lamed Zayin, Pasuk Chaf Hei, Pasuk 25, the Pasuk says over there, they throw him in a pit, and what's the next thing they do? Vayeshvu, they sit down, 
לאכול לחם. תאית. They again eat, but it was an eating of separation, it was an eating of hatred. We get together and we eat the korban with our families, unifying the family, serving to counteract the original eating, the meal in which the brothers took place. But again, that was a family that was left fragmented. Another example of where another law of the korban Pesach is that it had to be eaten in one place. So again, you can't just eat it and give your family in, in Honolulu and your other cousin in France and your other cousin in the South America. It had to be everyone in one place. It was very important that they were together as they were eating the Korban. Again, this is found in Perek Yud Bet, Pasuk Mem Vav. The Pasuk says, Bebayit um, Ehad Yachel must be eaten in one home. And finally, the fourth uh, detail for now of the Korban Pesach is that the Pasuk says, unlike other pieces of meat, it had to be cooked in a specific way. It had to be prepared, I should say, in a specific way. And that is, it had to be <coughs> roasted. It had to be roasted. We could not cook it. We could not eat it raw. This is chapter 12, Pasuk Tet. It says in the Pasuk, Tzeli Esh, Al Tochlu Mimenuna, you cannot eat it raw, Ubashel, or cooked in water. It has to be eaten Tzeli Esh. What's the difference for all the chefs in the house? What's the difference between cooking and roasting? Cooking, it loosens the meat. Roasting hardens and strengthens the component, the particles, bringing them together exactly what we were supposed to do as Klal Yisrael, if we are to leave Egypt. And therefore, the theme of unity, the theme of unity, excuse me, pervades the laws of, of the Korban Pesach, as we see um, how it really, um, it, it makes its way even into the details of the, of the Halachot. Of course, with this, we can now go back to Perashat Shemot, the first time God speaks to Moshe, and we can understand something else. Remember when we spoke about Perashat Shemot, God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, I want you to, um, God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, I want you to go free the Jewish people. And what is Moshe's response? Do you remember? What is Moshe's response? Moshe says no. And Jews are dying. Jews are being enslaved. And Moshe says no. For seven days, he's taking his sweet time, fighting with God. And we, we wonder, Moshe, what are you doing? You know, um, the Jews are dying. Go and free them. And Moshe's like, no, I'm not going to go free them. What was the reason Moshe didn't want to go be the leader of the Jewish people? Anyone remember? There was one underlying reason. Besides the fact that he couldn't speak. There was, that was just like, again, maybe a, a sketch reason. The real reason, the real reason God didn't, uh, Moshe didn't want to free the people was because he said, my older brother Aharon is going to feel slighted. Now, we may wonder. You know, it's nice that you, you know, you, you're sensitive to your brother's feelings. But Moshe, this is not the time. This is the time to get the Jews out of Egypt. The, the people are dying. And God has to assure Moshe, and don't worry, your brother will indeed be happy. He's going to really, and God has to guarantee. And then Moshe says, fine. If Aaron won't be hurt, then I'll go. But based on what we're saying today, Moshe's feelings, the sentiments that he has for his brother, is not just, uh, you know, uh, good manners. But it would have been, <laughs> the whole reason we're in Galut is because of hatred of one brother to the next. And it would have been counterproductive to go and free them on, uh, on the expense of hurting my brother's feelings. It would make no sense. And therefore, Moshe has to indeed make sure if we're going to get out of this Galut, to do it in a way that I'm hurting somebody's feelings. You know, I'll give you an example. I'll give you a, a short example. Imagine somebody is trying to, um, you know, there's a custom that if someone is in the year of a parent's death, they try to pray for the Amud. Right? You know what that means to pray for the Amud? They try to be Chazan. It's a custom. They try to be Chazan. You get extra Kaddish for, your, for, the, for the loved one. Right? Someone who's in the year. You always go to shul and you notice people asking, do you have a Chiyuv? I have a Chiyuv. Could I go? Could I pray? Do you mind? And again, it's, it's a beautiful thing. You get to say extra Kaddish. 
Sometimes though, sometimes there are two people that have a chiyuv. Two people that are both in the year and both want to be chazan. And unfortunately, they don't always um, come to you know, a compromise. Sometimes there's fighting and there's screaming, creating a big chilul Hashem. And, and if one just takes a step back and thinks about it, how contradictory this is. Here you are, you're trying to say Kaddish for your father. And why do you want to say Kaddish for your father, for your mother? Why do you want to be Hazan and go up? Because you want to make Kaddish a Kiddush Hashem. And so to make a Kiddush Hashem, the guy is making a Chilul Hashem and desecrating God's name, screaming and fighting. But again, sometimes we get so focused on the trees, we lose sight of the forest. Like the guy who embarrasses his wife because she, got, she forgot to cover the challah on Friday night. Hello, you idiot. Why did you forget to cover the challah? And he embarrasses his wife because God forbid that we should embarrass the bread. You know, the reason we cover the bread is so that it shouldn't see that the, the, the kiddush is being done on the wine. We don't want to embarrass the bread. So of course I'll embarrass my wife on the way. It's antithetical. And therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu is very careful not to embarrass his brother's uh, feelings. And therefore, um, these are again some thoughts um, from, from, the, from Rav Bernstein. Again, the Ben Ishchai points all of these uh, out as well. Um, and he says that if we, if we remember, we got into the Galut by dipping in blood. And we get out of the Galut by dipping it in blood. They first sold Yosef. The second was the dipping of an Aguda, of unity. The first was jealous, hatred, separation. The second was Achdut, togetherness. Um, and, and, and the mashal, the mashal of the father on his deathbed. He calls his children and he says to them, each of you go out and get me a branch. They go out, they get a branch, they come back. He says, break the branch. Each one breaks the twig. He says, now go, go and get me another one. They all go out, they get another one, they come back. He gives all of the branches together to his strongest son. He says, now break these twigs. The strongest son can't break them. The father turns to all his kids and he says, it's the same with you. If you're together, nobody can break you. The second you're separate, the second you're fighting, the second each one of you goes in your different ways, there will be mahloket, you will be able to get destroyed and to fall. And this is what Yaakov Avinu told his kids. He wanted to tell them when Mashiach is coming. Remember we spoke about this in Perashat uh, Vayigash, Vayichi. He says to his kids, you know, he wants to tell them when Mashiach is coming. But then the Shekhinah leaves and he doesn't have that permission. So what does he say? He'asefu, gather around. He wasn't just telling them, come in, huddle. But it was much more of a metaphorical type of he'asefu. If you want to get out of this galut, and, and that is the galut that we are in today. The galut, we know we lost the Bet HaMikdash because of the machloket, of fighting, of sin atrinab, of hatred. The Chafetz Chaim, he says, you know, I know if I went around asking everybody for a thousand dollars to rebuild Bet HaMikdash, we had to get to 10 billion and it would be here. I said, I could guarantee I would get you the Beit HaMikdash in one day. Each guy would give a million, two million, ten million, fifty million, a hundred thousand, whatever we could give. He says, God doesn't want money. He's not collecting money. Hashem is collecting unity. He doesn't want our, our dollars. He wants our love for each other, to be able to respect one another. And, and I think this is what, what it means when we say in the Haggadah, you know, it's a very, and it's a song that we sing, beautiful song. And we raise our cups on the little said and we say, and this is what lasted for us. It wasn't only once that people tried killing us. Every generation. Different forms, different countries. But Jews are very used to being persecuted. Time and again they have come. Not only once. Holocaust, the Inquisitions, and the Crusades. Throughout history, how many empires tried to destroy the Jewish people? Not only once, but we are here. The Akadosh Baruch Hu saved us. Matzilenu miyadam. God saves us from them all. But you know what the Khatam Sofer says? Shelo echad bilvad amad aleinu lechalotenu. He says a deeper reading into this. Beautiful. When we're not one, shelo echad. That's the only thing that can destroy us. That's bilvad amad aleinu lechalotenu. And so again, these are um, these are the thoughts from the Korban Pesach. These are lessons from Rabbeinu Bachiyeh 
reminding us that when the brothers sold Yosef, that's how they got into that galut. And the way they got out was only when there was Achdut. They had the Korban Pesach to bring them together. They had the bundle of Hisab to bring them together. And if we want to get out of our galut that we are in today as well, we need to be together. And it's again, only when we are together, like we say in the prayers of Shabbat, Ata Ehad, Veshimcha Ehad, Umi Ke'amecha Yisrael, Goy Ehad Ba'aretz. The Jewish nation, we only fully actualize our re- re- unique relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when not only we are with Him, but when we are one as a people with each other. We'll stop over here. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.